The Women's Engineering Society is a charitable company founded in 1919, supporting women in engineering. We were founded from the suffragette movement at the end of the First World War, and we honor that by our colors, green, white, and violet, which have always stood for good women votes. Over 100 years later, we still operate as a membership society, promoting the education of women in engineering and advancing the education of the public concerning the study and practice of engineering among women. We founded International Women in Engineering Day, INWED, held on the 23rd of June annually as an international awareness campaign to raise the profile of women in engineering and focus attention on the amazing career opportunities available in this exciting industry. And in 2021, with our theme, Engineering Heroes, to celebrate the women who have stepped up during the pandemic and at other times of need, we were delighted to reach, have a total potential reach of over 525 million globally. Our vision is of an engineering industry that employs the diversity of the society it serves to solve the biggest societal issues of our time. And this is partly why we are here today to discuss this, this topic. And our mission is to support women in engineering to fulfill their potential and support the engineering industry to be inclusive. This summer has seen the climate change crisis come home to Europe. Personally, when I saw the devastating floods in Germany I, and the fact that whole houses and towns were destroyed and something that we would normally see miles, thousands of miles away, I thought, this is real. And secondly, when I heard about the wildfires in Greece that were nearly reaching Olympia, the original te temple of Olympus and the original Olympic Games, it was a place where I've been, I've run that, that race, not very fast, I must admit. And again, knowing that the fires came close to somewhere I had been hit home. So now that climate change is on our doorsteps, that COP26 is due in, uh, in November this year, maybe, maybe the world will pay attention. And so tonight's topic is what does the future look like? What, uh, what should engineering look like in a world that is almost literally on fire? I am delighted to be joined today, one moment if I get the list up, <laughs> by Dr. Priti Parikh, Associate Professor at UCL Bartlett and Head of Engineering for International Development Centre. She is also a trustee for the Hapold Foundation and has recently been elected to the Institution of the Civil Engineers Council. Her research looks at access to infrastructure and resource challenge settings, combining engineering and social sciences. Our second speaker is Dr. Ellie Cosgrave, a civil engineer and also an associate professor at UCL. And I must say, which she hasn't put on her biography, she was a, a top 50 woman in engineering 2020 for sustainability, and we're very delighted that she was appointed as such. Her research is driven by three intersecting themes, the impact of rapid urbanization, technological innovation, and human well-being and social justice. We will also be joined by Mara Tafadzwa Makoni, who is a systems engineer with over 10 years of international experience in operational monitoring and due diligence advisory across sustainable development, renewable energy and transport. And she is um, um, on the panel or the advisory panel for the Association for Black Engineers. Mara is currently delayed in traffic, but she will be joining us on stage as soon as possible. Now, before we turn to the actual lecture itself, I would just like to say, uh, please ensure your mobile phones are off or on silent. When the question and answer session starts in the hall, the lights will go on. And if you are selected for a question, please stand up and wait for the microphone before you actually uh, ask your question. And this is fantastic timing because Mara has just joined us. Thank you. A round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> And so, having set the scene as the world is on fire, who are we as engineers uh, to be doing this? Um, so, in, it's on fire literally, Ellie, both literally and in terms of increasing inequality and a variety of other injustices, which a lot have come to the fore through the pandemic. What is the role of the engineer in contending with these global challenges and how do engineers need to be thinking and acting differently? 
Is that like a one-word answer? Or? <laughs> no, thank you so much for uh, welcoming me here today. It's really exciting to be here and be part of this conversation with such a distinguished panel. I, um, I want to start answering this question by first reflecting on who are we as, an engineer, as engineers and as an engineering community today? What are our characteristics? Where is our power? Um, and where is, does that really serve us and the world? And where do we need to start to dismantle and reconstruct or create space for more types of conversation? And so the first thing that I would like to say is that engineers as a group, we are people with a certain type of training which gives us a certain type of worldview. And that worldview, historically and generally, is a technocratic one that is based on our, our passion and our, our excitement and curiosity that stemmed from maths and physics. Yes, it was about the world, but really it was about this exciting thing that we can do with materials and stuff to, to solve problems. Um, we, and that has been kind of entrenched and worked through, through our, our training system that teaches us how to do that really, really well. Um, and the value system that sits underneath that is that we must do things with stuff and optimise stuff to make the world a better place. Uh, that means that we're quite extractivist, meaning that we take stuff out of the world and transform it and put it back into the world. And that's really our modus operandi. Um, and that's great. We have great skills and ability to do that. What we're less good at and, the, uh, um, and what we tend to devalue is the social and political um, analysis um, and, um, va va and, un and understanding. So we don't really know as engineers how to value people's feelings in our design. We want to as human beings, but we don't have the discipline or the structures in order to, to equate that with our mathematical models. Um, and so it's not only that we're not, we, it, it, uh, that we don't have the systems in place, but we actually think the mathematical models are more truth than the, than the social systems and the social understanding. There's, there's, so there's, that's one thing. So how can we create space where someone's feeling or every, everyone's feeling is as, much, as it's important as like the refinement process of a certain type of system. How do we include that in our processes in what we do? Um, we're also a bunch of people who are and must be sure about things. <laughs> like our job is to know things, and where we're not sure about things, we have to. We we are people who give us a percentage uncertainty. Right? So how do we uh, live in this deeply uncertain world? Well, what we do is we cling to certainty and what we do know. And that can be problematic because that is often deeply untrue. <laughs> so we're clinging to this like falsehood, um, but to make ourselves feel better, make our clients feel better, make kind of government partners and whoever we're working with feel better, we cling to uh, uncertain, um, uh, uh, be, is still being right. So how do we loosen up a bit, I guess is the question, in, in this deeply unknown, unknowable world that we're in? We need to be certain about th some things, but we also need to loosen up. So how, there's a bit of a, <laughs> um, a challenge there. We are also, whether we like it or not, a people and a group of people with immense power in the world. We are, and we are told that, and we continue to tell our students at UCL that they are the people who are going to change the world and solve the world and solve the crisis. So uh, engineering, the engineering community and engineers create huge economic, uh, like a, 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 a huge economic driver um, and have huge influence about where and how things get invested. Um, what do we do with that power? Like, are we all comfortable that we are um, uh, leveraging that power in a way that really serves the development of the world. And will we know, going back to the knowledge systems thing that I spoke about at the beginning, will we know that, that how do we know that we're, we're, we're doing that? Um, and so, yes, how do we leverage our power for good? But also, are we willing to give up some power? Are we willing to... Uh, challenge things that we as a community believe needs to be challenged and therefore maybe 
lose clients, maybe lose the allegiance of some government actors, um, stir things up a bit, be a bit activist. <laughs> I'm not sure that that's a particularly comfortable space for an engineer to be in, who, where we have often been told that we're sort of neutral and that we're going to this sort of truth of the, of the, of the maths and physics based one reality. Um, something that we'll, we can potentially pick up on. And finally, what <coughs> I would like to say about who we are is, particularly in the UK, but I think it is global, uh, we are men and we are white people, and we're uh, from a particular class. Obviously, that, that changes in different parts of the world, but essentially, we're, 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 we're a, quite a narrow group of society. And that's just true. And we, therefore, have limited experiences that we can bring to bear. So we need a di more diverse sector. How long have we been talking about that? I mean. 20, 100, 100 years. Well, <laughs> so, and, yes, and absolutely. Um, and so, there, where's the urgency behind that? Like, where is the urgency behind making sure that that happens? It's not a peripheral thing. This is, like, deeply important to us as a, as a, a community of people. Um, but not only that, you know, that's a really difficult problem to be, sol to be solved. We know about it. We actually know what we need to do. We just need to do it. Um, but where we do not have the insight and the expertise, uh, like even if we created a more diverse sector tomorrow, everyone, like engineering, engineers represent the whole of society and are equally, uh, yeah, uh, all, all voices count, we'll still be working on the values and the assumptions and the models and the world views that came out of, uh, you know, eternity of white supremacy and like ma a male view. And so what we need to start to be doing is gender mainstreaming, racial mainstreaming, and understanding the ways in which the tools by which we can include and understand uh, difference in, in, in society. So we know how to do uh, uh, gender aware engineering design. But does everyone know how to do that? How, and, and there are parts where we actually, it's not been tried before and there's gonna be tension. So, um, Yes, we need gender and racial expertise. So you've, you've very deftly pointed out that there is this massive power that comes from the roots of engineering, probably in the Victorian and pre-Victorian times of middle-class white men saying, yes, we know how to fix stuff, we know how to mend stuff, the whole industrial revolution, and we've exported that around the world. And we're still dominating as white middle-class men doing that. You know, 14.5% of UK engineers are women. That is actually about 180... That's, sorry, that's an increase of 185,000 in the last two to four years. So we have got about 700 and 800,000 women engineers in the UK, um, but it's a small drop in the ocean. And you've spoken about how we're going to be the ones who are going to save the world, rescue climate change, and we say this all the time, but that's still a very white, very dominant, very Eurocentric uh, approach. And while we've been saying, well, the rest of the world is on fire, but hey, we're fine until suddenly this summer Germany floods drastically, Greece has got these. So how do we then move from that to go to, say, the developing world and say, well, we know exactly what we're doing, and this is what you should do in the developing world to do climate change. Bish, bash, bosh, we're done. Now, pretty. <laughs> Tell me why understanding human behaviour is really important and why we do need to be more diverse in that situation. Absolutely. And first of all, it's such a pleasure being part of the conversation with amazing panelists and very timely as well as we tackle the two C's of COVID and climate change. Uh, I'm going to draw on some of my experiences of working closely with communities in East Africa. I'm an East African Indian. And in that work, we find that when households are provided, and provided is a top-down term that I use here, they are provided clean technologies and solutions. It is interesting to see that the story that emerges from this is complex and it's nuanced. And we find that households end up using a combination of clean and polluting fuels. So as a group, we started asking questions of why is it is, why is this happening? What is going on here? What can we learn from this? 
And we found what was interesting that households use different combinations of clean and polluting fuels depending on the circumstances, whether it was financial circumstances. And during COVID, it was um, interesting to see a lot of households were unable to afford to pay their energy bills and they were slipping into energy or fuel poverty as a result of that. We found, for example, that households would use solar panels, electricity from solar panels to charge their phones and lighting, but then they would also use kerosene lamps in parallel together. Or households would use LPG for clean cooking, but they would also cook traditional items on different types of stoves using charcoal or wood. And that got me really excited, thinking about, hmm, as an engineer, in university, we are not taught about human behavior, but actually it's human behavior which is dominating this transition pathway to clean energy. And that's when the penny dropped that human behavior is so, so important. It needs to be center stage in the argument. I mean, let's talk about something which is very personal to us, cooking. How we cook, what we cook, is a personal choice. So, we worked with households who were discussing beans and how they thought it's tasty if we would cook beans on a pot where it took longer, and yes, we used more fuel, but actually it's tasty, and that's the way we like it, absolutely. It was interesting when we did a blind test, test with them, where we asked them to taste pre-cooked beans and beans cooked in the traditional manner, and actually everyone felt that the beans tasted similar. But here you see that those perceptions and values matter. And this is something I think engineers need to respect. As engineers, we need to listen to those stories and learn from those stories. And I talk about East Africa. I work with families who consume tiny amounts of electricity. I mean, the amount of electricity they consume is probably similar to us switching on a light bulb for eight hours at the moment. So why is this important? This is important because in the future they will want to and they will need to consume more energy, so they will be consumers and emitters. So it's probably best if they are part of the conversation straight away, they are the ones driving this change as they are the ones who are leapfrogging to those clean solutions. Also this is relevant for UK because human values, motivations, aspirations matter here. I was just using public transport after a long time and I was thinking about the fact that I'm nervous. So our interaction and use of public transport now post-COVID is going to be based on our nervousness or acceptance or how comfortable we feel, uh, for example. If we think about, I'm going to use the example of football. I think everyone will be able to relate to football, hopefully. Uh, England versus West Germany 1990. What happened after the match with the penalty uh, miss out? A million kettles were switched on in UK. So think about the implication of that for design and uh, for energy provision. So human behaviors do matter, whether it is public transport, whether it is using treated wastewater, and how we feel about using treated wastewater in day-to-day -day consumption and lives. And when we think about climate change, yes, we have to introduce good policies, we need to think about subsidies, we need to think about technologies, but I don't think that's going to be enough. I think the next step is we will have to engage with local communities, and when I say engage, they need to be center stage, they need to be leading the conversation. And this is going to be a global conversation, not centric around one nation. And we have to remember within those conversations, and Ellie touched upon this quite nicely, that when we say community, it's not homogeneous. There will be groups, subgroups, there will be dynamics, there will be imbalances within those groups. There will be individuals who drive decisions and individuals who suffer adversely uh, from those decisions. But what I really want to say is, in a world where engineering uh, is important and in a world which is on fire, um, the human element needs to be center stage. Let's bring people back to the conversation. No, no, I would entirely agree because <clears throat> I noticed today that uh, I had some colleagues from Wes come into London today to work with us uh, and I had to drive, unfortunately I broke my leg and I can't walk far so I drove in and uh, 
apparently the trains were almost empty, but it took me nearly three and a half hours to drive in. And I believe that's because people feel safer in their own car, that they're not going to catch COVID. And also it's very comfortable. You can have the radio and you can you know, have your coffee and everything. So if we're going to take into account individual experiences and we cannot say, don't come in on your car because people say, don't want to die of COVID, we're then in a position that we've got these competing priorities. How do we save the world because the planet's on fire um, and yet deal with the, um, <clears throat> the indication of human behaviour? And Mara, uh, we know that within the developing world, we shouldn't be saying to these families, um, you can't have a fridge, you can't have a nice cooker, because we, you know, we've had them, and this is incredibly colonial of us to say you can't have the nice things. So where should our priorities be in terms of you know, personal uh, human behaviour and saving the planet? Uh, firstly, apologies for being late. Um, <laughs> and thank you very much for, for inviting me, and obviously thank you to uh, our, my fellow panellists for having me join them. Um, I think it's actually quite an interesting uh, question because I've, I've worked in international development, and one thing my, you know, you always used to get told um, is, you sp as engineers, we tended to spend a lot of time doing the front work. Like, a lot of, a lot of stuff is lost in overthinking things. Just think about there's somebody there who wants, open it, who wants water. Don't think about the tap yet <laughs> because mm. that sometimes can, you know, can change um, how we perceive a solution. So in the developing world, um, I think there has been quite some very interesting takes on how we understand what a solution is by understanding what somebody's trying to achieve, not what they want. In the same way that Yes, I do understand you know, that there's sort of complex problem there with, well, when we live in the developing world, we, we started off, a lot of people in the village actually had solar panels, but things like electricity is actually the aspirational. So it's actually trying to get people onto electricity system and we're trying to go the other way. So there's always that. But I always use, um, I think the whole world is now quite familiar with M-Pesa, which originated out of um, Kenya. However, it was actually developed by some, uh, some consultants in, in, in Cambridge. So <laughs> there was that contribution to you know, the UK development. And the reason that is always a fascinating story for me is this is, somebody had said, okay, so I've stepped off a plane and I've gone into Kenya and I'm like, oh, look, there are all these people in the village who can't get banked, what do we do? They don't have access to a bank because they want somewhere to take money out of or deposit money and all of that stuff. I think somebody would have come up with, you know, little micro banks that are set up around the village with a system that's central in Nairobi somewhere. But I think it was understanding the problem and the dynamics, the cultural context, the rural to urban migration. That is a lot of uh, people move from the rural areas and, they go to, and then you move to the urban areas and you always have that cultural context of having to look after your family and your wider family. And the problem becomes more com complex because of certain things like, you know, when you leave in the rural areas, probably you leave a vulnerable elderly parents there who can't sustain themselves and it really falls on you to sustain them. So if I'm to explain how this used to work, so I would be working in a, in a town and I would go to the local bus station. I would tell the conduct, I'll send a conductor with a letter telling my mother in the rural area that she was to come and uh, pick up money next week on Wednesday. So the letter gets delivered in the village. So every day my mom is probably walking 10 kilometers to check, is there a letter from R? Is there a letter from R? So she grabs hold on to, uh, she grabs the letter, comes back home, reads the letter, gets somebody to write this letter because she may or may not be able to write at this point, and then maybe comes back next week to say, confirmed, I have, you know, received, um, I will come next week. To get, and that was like a back and forth. That was a four month uh, process of trying to just simply say, well, I'm just trying to send five pounds. And of course I can't send 50 pounds in one group because that would be the most economical, but I don't earn that much, so I have to do it five pounds. So it just became a very laborious process. So it was understanding that there is a child who lives a village and still wants to find a way to support their mother. And I think then somebody goes, but what's the one thing they have? You know, some probably old mobile phone and making sure of an existing structure because chances are even if there is one mobile phone in that, you know, within 10 people in a house, it still can do the job. So it's, it, was, it was for me one of the most fascinating stories because it 
understanding those human behavior, the cultural context in which we provide these solutions, and also understanding what are the users trying to do. Because sometimes as engineers, we, are, we so love what we do, we want to show off like, oh God, look at what I can do. <laughs> look at what I can do, you know, what more I can add to this, what other technology I can throw at it. But sometimes, the reducing the complexity is, you know, tapping into existing network, existing networks, and using and challenging existing technology to act and service a different purpose or a different need. Using a telephone to service a financial, financial infrastructure. So that was for me one one of those moments that I always talk about. It's really what we learn from these sort of scenarios is where there's where where poverty sometimes exists. It challenges you to really think on your feet and how to actually, if you want to solve an immediate need, a life-depending need, you have got to challenge yourself to start to look at what is existing for infrastructure. And the sort of clever bit is how do I use, how do I also do that disruption by using something current in a completely different context with a view to saving a human life or responding to a human need. Um, coming back, I think the other, one of the things, um, uh, I know Preeti was talking about climate change, and one of the things that I always found interesting is also, as engineers, we're tasked with the responsibility to understand, as a society, to understand the impact of what we do and where the greater impact is felt. So while we're emitting all these gases, the real realities of climate change are probably harsher on those that already have nothing to work with, so you know, probably felt. So where is the real impact, the real consequences as humans as, um, of our action felt? So, there is that urge to look at climate change, but not because I'm sitting in England and I don't want to see a flood, but also to think, you know, as a fellow human, does what I do ultimately have a harsher impact on somebody who already has it bad? So really looking at and c coming back from, you know, stepping away from just a developing world and just challenging yourselves to make sure that we are making those impactful decisions that are important and reflective and fair for everybody we serve um, as engineers as well. Um, and that sort of cut brings me a step back to the sort of equality, which, you know, um, sort of sitting on the board for the Association of Black and Minority Ethnic Engineers in the UK um, has been front and center for, you know, where, you know, the sort of things I've tried to tackle around engineering, around equality, and that was brought up before. And I think if as engineers I would ask us to start to look at things, certainly in the last couple of, uh, last two years, it's we need to be children, you know, to consistently go, it's not fair, you know, <laughs> every five minutes to challenge, you know, it's seemingly challenging for fairness. It is, yes, it is a society problem, but even as a profession, things like we learned how things like COVID, for example, even in responses, how that is a pandemic actually was one of the most unfair pandemics. And the way in which we responded perhaps needed to look at, okay, who's gonna feel it the worst here? You know, even within our immediate and wider international societies, the world is increasingly complex. You cannot do anything and not see how that spirals over and stuff. Um, in an easy way, I'd say we should all be systems engineers, you know, be sitting at our tables during loops and seeing how, you know, we really need to understand um, how the world is increasingly interconnected and using that sort of moral code that we're taught as engineers to actually, in, you know, help build solutions for the world, um, looking at how we look around a room that was brought up as well, the how we, how, what does that look like? Again, where we work, we talk about 9% of engineers of the workforce um, being from black and minority ethnic um, backgrounds, um, which you think that's not entirely a reflection of our society. And I think sometimes we ask ourselves, why well, it's because, you know, you know, none of sort of black and minority ethnic engineers want to, what, uh, uh, students want to study. It's like, well, actually there's 32 percent uh, who actually choose to study the subject. So from 32 to 9 percent, so, you know, there's a bit of trying to explain how we lose them. Are we creating that fair platform where we bring in everybody who wants to be responsible to serve their own communities or to deliver the solutions for tomorrow to actually thrive and want to contribute? Are we giving that fair opportunity at the table and making sure, um, gonna be slightly controversial here. Um, <laughs> I always use, um, it's quite a heavy moment, but it was, you know, the Euro 2020, that, you know, uh, that infamous uh, penalty takeout. And it was, for me, it was what I always demonstrated. Sometimes in leadership, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's giving opportunity, but making the opportunity fair mm -hmm. and being holistic about how we create fairness 
thinking beyond, well, it's great if you get it in, but really having that step forward to go, but what if it doesn't? What does that mean as an actual consequence on somebody's life? And constantly challenging ourselves as we cre equally create those sort of fair platforms. Fairness is come in, but let me also make sure that you know the, the floor is level enough so you can, you, know, you can get across or you have what you need to thrive and when things go wrong, you have the support in there and I've thought through the impact of when things go wrong. Um, and then finally, I always say, um, if somebody asks, you know, the world is on fire, but, and we've seen this in the last couple of years, who are we as, philo as, as, as engineers? I think we're actually turning into philosophers. Mm. We are constantly now being challenged to, you can't, it was nice when you could just make the nicest car on the market, right? You know, and that was it, you know, he's swanky, everybody sees technology, go in, lane, lane departure, and that was it. But now it's like, you know, you have to, you're doing autonomous vehicles and it's now, these are now ethical challenges. You know, we're going into a space when people are asking you those moral codes when you're, or the ethics of actually, you know, we're, we're automo automotive engineers are increasingly being software and then you go into software, sort of software world of designing software and that and also engaging with other industries, well, we just produced the car, who, who cared what the insurance man said, you know, right? But now the insurer is going, well, who owns liability for when this thing, you know? So we're increasingly engaging with the wider field. I know our problems are getting more complex, we are being put out of our comfort zone, um, and I always say, yes, yeah, so we're becoming sort of philosophers in the way that we think more ethically about what we are. We are forced to think more ethically because some of the solutions, like autonomous vehicles, do require us to put ethics first. Before we Absolutely. I mean, so much, so much there, Mara. I'm like, we could probably sit here for another three hours just to discuss what you've just said. But um, I, I'm struck by the fact that maybe a white Victorian engineer would look at the problem of banking in Africa and say, what we need to do is build lots of little buildings in villages so that we've got a banking system. But actually, the solution is having an app on a mobile phone because everybody has a mobile phone and then it's almost instantaneous. Uh, and then from there, that's, it's, it's, it gets to me the essence of engineering. We, we know how to build buildings. Let's just build a building. But if we then say, well, what is the requirement? The requirement is not the building, the requirement is the money. And how do we fix that? <clears throat> and um, I'm also a systems engineer, so that whole connection <laughs> I'm more on the philosophical, philosophical thinking side. And I, people say, what is systems engineering? And I say, it's the relationship between people and stuff. You know, so we can build a bank and we can have the people use the bank, but what's that relationship? And that example is perfect in, in that way. But also you, you then go on to develop this into um, uh, how we need that diversity of thought. Because as I said, you know, the white Victorian engineer comes along and says, I'll tell you what you young people need over here is this bank building. And actually, that's not what they need. And then to bring it through to the ethics, um, uh, and I'm missing out a whole lot of what you've just said there. Um, but I'm struck by, um, I was listening to a podcast um, about autonomous vehicles and um, revisionist history. And this guy says, basically, when we have autonomous vehicles, because they are, will be trained to stop when people um, are in the way, essentially all travel in built-up areas will come to a standstill because anybody could just step into the road and certainly be the great way to protest would just be to step into the road <laughs> and stop all these vehicles from moving. But Ellie, tell me, pick up on something on all of that amazing thing that Mara just gave us and I let's mean, go with this. I mean, yeah, it's, <clears> just, it's just so exciting to be engaging in these conversations. I think what we're highlighting here is that, that technology and engineering is intractable from culture and human experience and what we're able to do. And that is where the great power of engineering is. That's where we kind of hold our cards, right? We can go into communities and change them. We can be like, what you need is blah, blah, blah. And because of all the things I mentioned, we have the power to do that. What we need to be able to do is reframe the question, like the, the title of this talk is not what, how will engineering solve the world that's on fire? It's like, we need to change, because very, very intentionally, we need to change the conversation for what is our slice of the pie, because we are not, the people who need to be going in and telling people what's up. We need to go back to that original engineering, which is not building a building, but solving a problem and being creative. Our contribution is a skill set yeah. of uh, deconstruction and reconstruction for a problem. So like that's how what we can offer this room 
of people and communities. Uh, and unfortunately, what we do just inherently in our language is, oh, I'm the person who's going to save the world, and oh, I'm the person who's like got this really nifty thing and that we'll try it and you'll definitely want it. Oh, they're saying they don't really need it. They don't know. Yes. But once they see this wonderful thing that I can produce, then, you know, then there's all the... And, uh, so I, I really enjoyed your language that you kept um, coming up with, is that we serve people, the people that we serve. And so often there's that some strange like, dynamic that happens. It's like, who, where do we place ourselves when we are in service of people? And often we end up placing ourselves as like higher up, the educated, the like all-knowing, uh, rather than actually zzz, open heart and, and understand and, and, and providing and creating a platform for things to happen. Stay, um, the, um, how do we then learn to do that when our, when our engineering culture says and sets us up and we're paid to know and do. I think what we have to do as individuals and as a community is read stuff, <laughs> be really curious, listen to the current conversations that are happening around tra uh, gender uh, uh, spectrum and racism, uh, understanding what it means when someone accuses us of being, well, that's pretty neo-colonial of you. Like, what does that mean? We need, and we are entrenched, we are affected by patriarchy and racism, we are all of those things, and the way we get out of it is by educating ourselves, and that's a personal responsibility, that's, and that's a lot of work, and so that, other, and, and it's urgent, because if we don't do that as people with power in the world, then we're going we're gonna to be the problem, and so it's our personal work, and it's our personal challenge to... <laughs> to work this stuff out, read the books, and yes, speak to people with lived experience without demanding of them. But yeah, I, like, this will not change unless everyone in this room and every other room realizes that they don't know stuff yet. They don't know what's up. Yeah, and I, I find that uncertainty exciting, actually, because um, one of the things that we do as engineers is we learn by failure. You know, we try something and it fails. So we try it again and it fails better. And then you've learned something. Um, and I think that the domination of the Victorian white male engineer over centuries, which still continues today, um, means that there's an element of, well, it, it shouldn't fail. And, um, yeah, we don't it, it, always check in that well about how well this worked. Can I just yes, one? Course, I'll stop talking yeah. soon. But the one example, the um, the autonomous vehicles, that's going to be really obvious when that doesn't work, right? So, yes, like there are going to be lawsuits and stuff's going to go down. So we're taking that really seriously. But when we put only steps in. That's uh, into like, uh, a building or yeah. wherever. That has a real failure for a huge amount of people who are trying to access that infrastructure. Engineers are being philosophers and making the decisions about what is acceptable. It's just that we don't see it because it's not new, because we've always been failing people by not putting ramps in. Because we think we know, we know better. So we're engineers are always, go ha always have been philosophers. We've just not been very good at it, not very, not very good. skilled. <laughs> So, so, Prissy, let's have some practical example of that. Well, we've seen some of the socio-cultural barriers that Mara's had just brought through. And, um, but we, in terms of clean energy transmission, you know, the, the, the failure is we started out in the, in the Industrial Revolution polluting the world. We've gradually got cleaner and cleaner, and it's only because it's um, summer that we've not had as much, for example, wind engine energy. So how can we kind of miss out the middle bit that's happening in India and China with all of the big pollution to get to clean energy to the right places quickly because I would hate to see the rest of the world go through that cycle that we've done because it will destroy the planet even more. I mean in a way uh, those countries are leapfrogging and they are doing things better than us. Um, I guess as engineers and I want to come back to the point Ellie and Mara made about 
uh, what is our role as engineers? Our role is to serve. But in reality, it is very difficult. Uh, I talk about, as an academic, I talk about participatory approaches and co-development and how we need to work together to identify the problem, first of all, understand what needs and aspirations and develop solutions. But it is really, really hard to do this in practice. I've sat in meetings where we set out an agenda and what we thought was the problem, and we, after three hours, we realized that the problem is different. And we walk out of the meeting going, okay, oh my God, we've not achieved anything. There's been no progress made. And you have to go through a series of the sessions to get to that eureka moment of, okay, now I understand what you need. And now let's listen to your ideas, your solutions. Uh, so I think there are opportunities for engineers to work with a lot of humility, I think. Humility is very, very important. And we don't quite talk about that in our profession the need to be humble, the need to listen, the need to respect each other. Uh, interesting enough, I'm working currently with WaterAid, uh, where we had a series of discussions, and a year later they came back to us and said, well, you actually listened to us. We work with a lot of academics who simply do not listen to us. So I think it's very important that we respect each other, we learn from each other, we listen to each other in forming those solutions. Just um, imposing or providing clean technologies, for example, in the energy field is not going to be enough. Mm. I think we need to know why they need, why communities need energy, how they're going to use it. What are the day-to-day -day lived experiences? What are the day-to-day -day lived experiences of a boy, a girl, male of the household, female of the household? And they are very different experiences. We find quite often a lot of um, kit, I'm going to just say the word kit broadly, is or gadgets are given out to households. The registered user of that kit would be the head of the household, typically male. So they get training on how to use that kit, whether it's a solar panel, battery box, whatever it is. But ultimately, it's the women who end up using that solution more. Mm. So it's also understanding who are going to use, who are the users, end users, who bear the brunt or burden of infrastructure. I mean, we spoke about COVID and who bears the burden of COVID. So equally, when we have poor infrastructure or poor engineering solutions, who bears the burden of that? Well, absolutely. I have a friend in India who was um, telling me right at the beginning of the vaccination program that half a million or however many million vaccines were actually sitting barely 10 miles from her house in Mumbai, but they were due to be shipped to the UK to vaccinate the white Western world, and what were we doing in order to continue to vaccinate the, the whole world? Because we're not going to be safe until the whole world is safe. And today we hear that people of my age will, will be given booster vaccines. And whilst I'm thinking, well, thank goodness, because you know my family is in a vulnerable situation, and isn't that great and terrific? But then there are people in the developing world, and even in some European and American states, European countries, American states, who don't have vaccination you know how do we stop behaving in this way where we're completely inequitable Mara um, and I think I always say um, the the interesting thing is if we come back to the healthcare system mm. right that is entire is so diverse so <laughs> without collecting a lot of those cultural experiences stuff we miss an entire trick here and actually standing back and understanding because you've got people who even it stems out to an international community. We could have used that as an opportunity to tap into this and actually understand some of the health, um, sort of the challenges faced in some of these international communities we're trying to provide, to provide those healthcare solutions for. You know, somebody would have sat with somebody who's, who comes from, I don't know, Nigeria, they would have explained exactly where those barriers are. Because, for example, for a country like South Africa, those, solution, those um, vaccines were just landing and going expiring because there was a decision that people would register on technological advice, uh, technology device when half the people live in the rural area. So they actually, they were sitting there and all the young people are like, well, can you vaccinate us? But the old, no, 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 we've got to do the old people first, but they were not uptaking this. It was purely communicated. So I think we miss a lot of opportunities by not just looking around and tapping into some of these lived experiences. There is nothing more powerful than a collection of lived experiences that are diverse because it stops those moments when you make errors. You know, somebody out, I mean, somebody out there might pick, um, might pick up on something you've missed on. 
you know, because of the experience, because they've been in a different context or they bring something to the table. So it, it keeps, we keep fighting for that, you know, fairness. It's not to just to make fair for those that we, you know, we're bringing to the table. It also, it actually goes out to be fairness and a service to the actual community. So if we challenge ourselves to be diverse in who we bring to the table and how to develop solutions, in effectively, we're effectively building a, div a, a much more inclusive society, we're contributing to inclusion and all of that stuff. Um, I'll use a very random example. Uh, we were once asked by an um, organization as, an, as AFBE to evaluate CVs. Um, no doubt a lot of big organizations have, you know, the most, uh, what they call the most well-developed recruitment processes, you know, they go, oh God, yes, we have, we can blind CV this thing, we're really good at it. But us at AFBE, we looked at it and we were, nine out of 10 of us were Africans. Um, and we actually represented four different countries on there. So there's this one, I was the only Zimbabwean there. And this CV comes along. Um, and I think to a large extent we had gone, might not fit the profile, but looking at you know, something like the exam results, you know, what they've done in experience. But suddenly I looked at this student CV and having the first thing that struck me is where this student went to school because it became about for him to have come from this point to even have had an opportunity to leave the country and to pursue any, any kind of um, education is actually a rarity. You know, I, it, I didn't have statistics at the point, but it takes moments like that to pick that out, right? It's, I'm not saying we should all you know, <laughs> go and make sure that every citizen is represented on any recruitment panel, but it's just an example how sometimes those gems are picked up. So sometimes we are put in a society where we're left to evaluate somebody by what is presented in front of us, and there's that, okay, they must, they must fit this mold. We've already created, as humans, we create this perception of this is what fits in. But sometimes with those lived experiences, it was often interesting. We pick up on some little nuances and little gems within there. So I always say, whatever you do, just as engineers, you need to ask myself, I ask, ask yourself, is there somebody else who might look at this thing very differently? Well, yes, because somebody might say, well, they've, they went to school in Zimbabwe, they came to the UK, that's terrific, wonderful. But you know, because you've done that, what that actually meant in terms of what they had to sacrifice in terms of their family and the, the obstacles they had. And exactly. they, they still managed to get a 2-1 or a first-class honours degree or whatever. And even if, they, the, the, I think that the thing was more, if they don't, yes. but you're sort of looking at the resources that the student would have had. Yes. You're probably looking at a student who probably had to work 10, 10 jobs and never had anybody in their family even leave the country and all of that stuff. So it's actually understanding this context is very different. I don't understand. I, I'm sorry, I would understand if you told me they came out with a third class because really they wouldn't have just had enough resources. You're just landing in a country, uh, no access to resources, nothing, and then you have to go and perform the way that me that never had a second job at school, at university, at the same, you know, it's just not, it, it doesn't, but it's, it's not like, um, again, it's, you know, do they go to the university and just, you know, just put their hand up and go, no, 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 you know, you, you're grateful to have the opportunity and you put your head down, you get, you get on and stuff. So I always, I, I always just generally love the fact that sometimes, even when we do what we do at AFPs, it's just, it's just looking at, okay, even as blacks and minority ethnics in this year, our lived experiences are so different, you know, first generation immigrant, a second generation, or, you know, our lived experience, I mean, just culturally. Oh, yes, whether you, whether you come from Zimbabwe or Nigeria or exactly. Kenya or, or, or wherever, there will be different experiences. And yet I think, f f speaking as a white person in Britain, I wouldn't be able to tell that unless I was really attuned to accent or had your CV in front of me. <laughs> and even then, somebody might say, well, what's the difference between Zimbabwe and South Africa? You know, we, and, and, you know, because... We're encouraged to think of Africa as this big monolithic culture, whereas actually it's incredibly nuanced, and the countries are so big we in Britain can't comprehend that. You know, so Ellie, yeah, go, <laughs> go. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. I I think this exactly this these these skills of understanding lived experience and what what the meaning behind certain uh, statements, certain histories are, 
is it demonstrates like how uh, you know that's in a, a recruitment process but if we were doing that in terms of participatory approach to any kind of infrastructure implementation it, we would need the skill sets to be able to survey on a on a scale lived experience rather than simple uh, like uh, data around like age um, where where you need to move to um, and so it's not just let's stick a bunch of solar panels on a roof. It's going to be, and teach the and the head of the household is a man. And he's going to insist on being tall. Actually, it's going to be the woman who's going to have to make sure that all the connections. Are, so yeah, how yeah, do we understand? Do we do that? You know, without just kind of simplified anecdotes, how do we use the skills of social scientists, uh, as social and social data scientists to include that in? what we meet and know about the meaning of this infrastructure and what, therefore, the decisions will be. I think it was, I was reading Bell Hooks uh, recently and she talks about the difference between our values and our values in action. So you would, and what she says is you would find it difficult to find anyone who says, I disagree that we should, I mean, there are people. <laughs> uh, uh, I, would, I disagree that you know, people should have equal access to resources and that everyone should have the right to live happy and fulfilling lives. Um, the problem comes when we have to make different choices because we have now more detailed information. So what she says is that you say, okay, um, this person believes that women should not face uh, domestic violence. But if you challenge uh, that person to say, well, if you want to ensure that women do not experience domestic violence, you need to understand and acknowledge this thing called patriarchy, which places uh, men in a position of domination, gives them the predominant resources, and that there are masculinities that, uh, uh, that reinforce and uh, these dynamics, and we need to dismantle them. Then they'd be like, whoa, 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 uh, no. And I think the same can be true in terms of how we create inclusive participation in any kind of scheme. Oh, yeah, but you don't understand. They're always banging on about that. Same in a boardroom, same in any yeah. kind of room. This is what we said in our conversation before, that there's the... Um, Sarah Ahmed talks about the, um, the feminism as a pedag uh, fe feminist pedagogy as a pedagogy of the eye roll. So I know I'm doing well if everyone's... She's talking about women again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so, Preach. so rather than taking that as a as a time to stop, then we we know that that's a time where we're starting to make people uncomfortable, and it's time to push harder because they can't say no, stop talking. They all they can do is eye roll. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I like the fact that you were saying that the engineers need to collaborate with social scientists in order to understand this. And, um, and there are, what other disciplines do you think we need to engage with because of these complex challenges uh, that we have? I mean, so uh, Elia said social scientists. Um, uh, what's your perspective here? Well, when it comes to behaviour, behavioural scientists, and I mean, this came out really during COVID where... Um, there was a realization that with the pandemic, uh, behavior, um, whether people decided to wear a mask or follow guidelines was very much dependent on something called behavioral science, mm. for example. So behavioral science, geography, anthropology. Um, I mean, I work with a range of disciplines, for example. Um, even within the built environment, it's not just about engineering, there's planning, there's architecture. There are a multitude of disciplines which need to come together because our world is a complex and messy system. Uh, we live in a mess. It's complicated, but it's interconnected. And what we do not realize is we make a change somewhere and it has a knock-on impact somewhere else. Uh, I'm doing a lot of more interesting work around sustainable development goals where we find that if we provide energy, it has a link with all 17 goals and 140 out of 169 targets. So in effect, as soon as you put an energy solution of some form or shape, it immediately has links with poverty and food and resource consumption. And those complex links are hard to follow through. And this is why those conversations matter. But those conversations are different because I find that when I speak to anthropologists or social scientists, they use a very different language. So the first thing we have to do is understand the language, um, lay of the land, what are the common terms of reference, 
And those conversations are very difficult to have. Um, well, I agree, which leads me on to my final question for Mara before we go to the questions, which is, um, you know, we've spoken a great deal about different cultures and different uh, situations, and you know, Ellie's spoken about, well, if we're to have removed domestic abuse, that might mean stopping traditional cultural male behaviours in the UK, I would imagine, as well as other areas. So what can individuals do to inform, influence, engage, and shape policy and support engineering when, you know, as Ellie said right at the very beginning, we are the kind of people who know, and we need to be listening to these individuals. So what can individuals do? Um, I think um, it comes back to, you know, we need to be mor morally driven, but also driven by creating the right solution that are respectful of people's cultures and people's backgrounds and people's lived experiences that are not patronizing. Um, I like that example about domestic violence because I worked on a project in Kenya where they went out, they went onto a village and they said, oh, look, they have women have to walk 50 miles to get water. Let's make, the, make sure there's a well within five meters. And nobody used it because the women like, no, actually, I like walking my five kilometers. I get to meet my fellow women and we can have our little gossip. I can be away from home. It's like, well, I mean, that's, you know, it's a bit of a stretch in, you know, context, but um, it sort of tells, challenges us, you know, when we land in a, in, in a scene and let's not look for what's missing. Let's engage first and work back backwards. But sometimes you can, we have this thing of asking somebody, uh, you walk in and your name is Water Aid. It's like, what would you like? Geez, I don't know, water. <laughs> <laughs> Ask them. We need, to, we need to train ourselves to see the interconnections of what we do. We need to be responsible to be, to be more systems thinking in how we do those philosophers that are guided by moral and ethic. But most importantly, really go back to that service, understand your role is to come in and really work backwards and say, well, there's a solution to be built based on a need that I've identified, not I can identify an opportunity. And most importantly, I think overall, we need to be, again, engaging those other sectors like retail. You know, if people, if there's an industry that knows how to influence people, I mean, people blow bread smell in, in a shop, come on, uh, <laughs> to get influence. I mean, they, they are, we are at a point where we're developing new <laughs> solutions within mobility. We want to change how people engage with energy use and energy practice, how people, in, uh, how people interact as a transport engineer, we're trying to influence people's choice of transport mode uh, within the mobility space. So how do we, who, who are the people who are leading this space? You know, you don't want to wake up and also engage the wider pri sort of private sector. You know, you, we, you talk of Amazon, you know, they started off as selling books and these are people, how, how do we understand the, where they're going in their retail space? Because before you know it, these guys were just messing up our roads with their, you know, Amazon drivers, you know, changing how everybody, interacts. we saw exactly how that trans transpired within COVID. So I think there's a lot to ask ourselves to be very wider than an engineer. You know, you need to be wider than an engineer. You need to learn from society, look at all these other industries that have, we traditionally wouldn't sit in a room with, even if you're making policy, you don't sit with somebody from Debenhams, but you, you know, you, you now think about what they do day in and day out, because the entire survival is around influencing people to make different choices about how they engage with their products. Mm. Brilliant. We've had some great uh, chat in the comments as well. They're a great panel, not what I was expecting. Uh, uh, Let's give the women a tap in their homes and give them a coffee shop to catch up. <laughs> uh, and then somebody uh, has said, sorry, I can't I move my chat up and down. Oops, sorry, this is the joys of an iPad. Uh, we, several people have been talking about, this is from Sandy Rees-Jones, uh, several people have been talking about humility and arrogance. On major projects, we have to move from dad, decide, announce, defend, to mum, meet, unify, and motivate. I absolutely love that, I think. Um, and this is very inspiring, uh, 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 which is brilliant. So, um, we now go to questions. I do have at least one question from the chat here, but does anybody in the room have a question? Uh, you can put your hands up immediately, or I can ask the question that's on here while you think about it. Sarah, just, if you'd like to stand up and we'll get a mic to you. I don't magically know Sarah's name. I wish I did, that I had. <laughs> but Sarah's, Sarah's a member of WES. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. Yes, uh, Sarah Haslam. I'm a council member on the, for WES. And I should probably admit as well, I am an automotive engineer. 
I work for Ford Motor Company and I'm chief engineer for software and advanced features on our transit vehicles. And I can assure you that uh, we do have a level of autonomy on the vehicles already. So if you do stand in front of a transit, it will stop. We have an active collision protective feature on there, but don't recommend that on the way home, of course. <laughs> um, but really interesting panel discussion. Lots of thoughts going on in my head about a lot of more responsibility as an engineer to take on and a different way of operating. Can the panel sort of suggest how we're going to inspire this next generation to take on this extra responsibility and different way of being a little bit more loose? How are we going to inspire that next generation? Because it's already exciting to be an engineer, but how do we inspire that next? Mm. I'm not going to take a question for everybody because we'll, otherwise we'll be here way past eight o'clock. So who would like to take that one? Ellie? I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I'm happy. Uh, I, I think the next generation is chomping at the bit, I think the next generation is incredibly inspired. And so I think the question, and I, we see this at UCL with our um, engineering undergrads, they are up for it. <laughs> and they, you know, so um, I think it's much more about uh, holding space and like a, a wise council, like <laughs> the wise elders, I'm not sure I'm there yet, um, but that th this is about being able to have these kinds of conversations with our students. We, we have a, a, a um, two-year, uh, uh, end of the second year, they, the students have a design challenge. Um, the program's called How to Change the World, slightly problematic in terms of like who's going to do the work. But anyway, um, uh, but they, they are given a real-world complex challenge, um, and we spend two weeks in teams, working it through, dismantling it, deconstructing it, and holding space for these complex uh, conversations to be had. And it kills them every year that they're not allowed to pick up a design thinking anything until the second week. So all of the first week is about contending with what is rethinking, uh, uh, deconstructing, trying to understand all the dynamics that are at play. That's one way that we can do it through education. Um, but I. I think that the, what we need to make sure we do not do, instead of rather what we do, is to limit and shut down these, all these possibilities that are coming up in the imagination of, of young engineers and young people, about who they want to be in the world and how. It cannot be, oh no, <laughs> can't do that, I'm afraid, uh, design codes don't allow it. Okay, don't do it if the design codes don't allow it, but what were you trying to get for there? What was the thinking behind that? How can we get that same outcome and train that critical thinking and that uh, being able to look out, outside into all parts of ourselves and our lives, making sure that we can bring our own selves and our own personalities to work, I think is going to be a massive change that we need to Absolutely. make sure happens. Yeah, so Bethany Hall on the comments said, I had a vision one day that a future engineering company I could work for would include as many humanities arts professionals as engineers scientists with actors who bring our ideas to life and historians who help us understand the context of our work and psychologists who help us understand how things will be used. Connecting society with problem solving. Imagine how fun and effective that would be. I would want to work there. Mind you, I'm very lucky because I run the Women's Engineering Society, so I bring the engineering and I work with fantastic women engineers who are members. But of course, my team uh, are not engineers. You know, we've got a membership manager, a partnership manager, events people, comms people who are used to bringing all of that balance and not just the, the engineering to it. So it's terrific. And, and engineers are also people. Absolutely. Right? I don't know yes. if you noticed, not, but there are loads of like dancers, artists, poets who are engineers. Why not allow those parts of themselves to come to work too? I'm sure, I think we have this dynamic where work must be one thing. Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And we call work that which we get paid for, not necessarily the work that we do to make friends, to build families, to build communities, or to keep clean and, and, and care as well. Uh, so I have a question uh, on the chat, but I, if you do have a question, raise your hand and I'll come to you shortly. Um, on the values for reimagining corporate purpose to deliver profitability and sustainability, can you share insights on practical and ethical imperatives undertaken by large engineering firms in the global north to address the effects of climate change and inequality facing undeserved communities 
in resource-constrained settings where Adam Smith's invisible hand is invisible. I think we can all agree that the invisible hand doesn't exist. Sorry to be controversial. <laughs> but, um, uh, Mara, would you like to say that, or Pretty? I think basically they're saying what, a, what, a, what practical and ethical imperatives are large engineering firms in the north doing to address the effects of climate change in under-resourced communities? I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of CSR um, initiatives around... Um, well, we do, you know, the net zero carbon, or you know, give, you know, making sure ethics are upheld as far as how they they work in sort of um, in the third world. But I, I'm, I often find it um, the balance between having the action plan and seeing those credible results. Because I think we, what we te what corporates then tend to do is also hide behind the numbers. It's like, oh, this looks ugly, so don't publish that. Um, so there has to be that transparency mm. and accountability for how much of what we're doing actually translates to that. So we don't know that. We just know what, what the action plan is. We must stop doing this. We don't want to do this. It's net zero. It works with UK policy. This is what we'll do. And then, you know, we obviously don't need to stop hearing about, you know, use, use of underage children and, you know, in, 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 along the value chain and stuff. And I also think sometimes even that accountability, it's very easy, you know, within systems to, to, to just redefine your scope so you're less accountable where it starts to get uglier and murkier. So, <laughs> so obviously, even when we do life cycle assessment, you know, where do you start and where do you stop? And you can conveniently make some, some, some little targets for yourself within these, in, in these you know, CSR and action plans, which conveniently sometimes are not as challenging. So I'd like to see definitely a bit more transparency, a bit more in terms of actually really articulating how they understand what impact that is actually on the underserved communities. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, I wanted to bring course, in the yes, point of local do. partnerships as yes. well. And especially it's been interesting during COVID uh, when a lot of us are not traveling now and uh, we have had to rely, it's probably the wrong word, but we have had to engage with local partners more um, and I think possibly in the future, an interesting modus operandi could be that we are more and more um, reliant on local partnerships. We are led by their knowledge, we are led by their understanding. And in a way um, that has a double benefit of A, we travel less, of course there's a reduction in emissions practically, but also um, there is a lot we can learn and we can foster those local networks and partnerships, especially organizations who, ha who are embedded in local communities and understand their needs. So I think local partnerships will be an important uh, pathway forward. And we can harness that through the world of the internet to then take the initiatives and where, apply them where it fits in other communities of similar needs. Fantastic. Can I just throw in a little funny Please, yeah. <laughs> anecdotal to add to that? Just reminded me of something that I, an example we use to explain why local partnerships are important. Um, a local company, um, it's an Indian manufacturing company, who had literally set up the entire uh, fa manufacture around East, you know, they were really locally present. So they were competing against another um, Unilever. So Unilever, I think somebody sat there, did the mats and said, you know what, it's actually much more effective to sell margarine in say 100, so in 100, um, 100 gram packages but they decided to sell theirs in, 10, in about 15 grams, which is enough for one slice of bread, because local knowledge tells you nobody has a fridge. Uh, <laughs> so if you sell me 100 grams, can you imagine how hot Kenya is in like 35 degrees and just stuck with margarine for 10 days? And also what's called a consumer basket. You know, people are not as liquid. You know, you talk about that whole, you know, living on a daily day. I might have money for butter today. I might not have money for butter tomorrow. So when I have my 50p, which competes with the child school fees, um, all of this stuff, it's local context saves you a lot of waste, <laughs> wasted. And it's, it's, you know, companies continuously think, well, no, local partnership just finds lo a local person, but it's like really embedding yourself in the culture and the companies and the environments that you really work in will give you a bit more useful knowledge. Yes. And actually just assuming if I just reduce X amount and do X, Y, Z, it might trickle into effect. So it, it comes to that point that local context, local knowledge, and no, local embedment. Is that yes, the I, I was reminded um, that somebody um, 
we, we were talking about um, air, aircraft emissions and and when we had the uh, a brief civil war in Kenya a few years ago, um, what happened was that the Kenyan flower market collapsed because no tourists went to Kenya. And what happened on the flights back from Kenya was they also in the hold took chilled flowers from Kenya to Europe and that collapsed because nobody was flying to Kenya. So it's thinking about that whole system and that whole context that's absolutely important. So uh, somebody in the middle, yes, this chap with the pale jacket, if you could stand up please and say your name and where you're from and then ask your yes, question. Uh, my name is Nicholas Falk uh, from the Urbed Trust. I, I'd like to ask about education and how it needs to change, particularly given that several of you were uh, in that business. Um, we're working with a group of social enterprises in southern India, in Tamil Nadu. They want to set up a centre for sustainable development. And they've actually asked Bureau Happold if they could help in uh, training for um, people typically doing engineering. And I'm wondering, what would one be changing in the way engineering is taught um, if one really wanted to be in the forefront of, uh, uh, of good practice? Uh, I would also just say one more thing. It seems to me fire needs water. I mean, it's water that's the biggest challenge of all, uh, certainly in dry parts like Tamil Nadu. So I, I'm wondering, are you equipping, or how, how, could, how can we in the UK or the West help the people struggling with uh, those sorts of challenges of just not enough water and then expanding population. Do we have the educational tools? And if so, how does one transfer them? Maybe I can pick up on some of those uh, questions. I'll start with the water one. I mean, I talk a lot about water as well in my day-to-day -day, uh, life. Uh, with water, it is interesting uh, because water is seen as a basic human need. It's seen as a human right. So there are sensitivities around how you pay or you charge for water as well. So water is a very difficult form of infrastructure um, to debate and discuss. And within that, especially in low-income communities, then it comes down to what type of solution is suitable. The tragedy I sometimes see is there is this assumption that if you're working with communities with low income, the solution can be shoddy and substandard. And I'm being very straightforward and frank here. Uh, but in reality, uh, engineers need to come up with solutions which are effective, which are economically viable, which are clever, and which meets needs. And there's quite often a debate I have around whether, therefore, a centralized, shallow solution is better than, say, centralized solutions, where the burden of operating and maintaining the solutions fall on the households. And when it falls on the household, who does it fall on? whether it's the male or whether it's the female member of the household. So in developing the solutions, the questions to ask is, with the solution, where does the burden of operating and maintaining that solution lie, financially, emotionally, and physically? So I think uh, so a lot of my work, for example, in India has been in high-density settings like slums, where uh, network infrastructure has been a good solution, but nevertheless, that's not the only solution. And it has required us to revisit standards because in water scarcity regions, what are the standards, what are the requirements for water consumption? Um, how can we design solutions which are nature sensitive? Um, one of the most expensive components of infrastructure is manholes. So if we make manholes shallow, uh, that cuts the cost substantially. So it's, it's challenging standards and best practice and guidelines uh, which quite often in cities are designed for the effluent, which is probably 40% of the city. So thinking about how we can reject those uh, standards and, and practices. And sorry, I think you had an initial part of the question. There was, there's a question about how can we change the education of engineering. There is actually a movement to change engineering to be more, as you were saying, Ellie, uh, that let's look at problems and how we solve them rather than teaching mass physics and then how to make an electrical current. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, just um, one, um, one subtle point. I've stopped using the word solution in my lectures. Mm. And it's quite tricky to <laughs> stop doing that. Um, and the reason I have done that, and I make it very explicit at the beginning, is that a solution suggests a right answer. When we think about an equation, there's a solution. And it suggests that's the answer and that that's done. 
solved. And what I much rather encourage is an intervention. How are we intervening in the system? How, uh, how are we, what is our intended impact? How do we know that we've done it? And it keeps it a bit more systemsy, but it allows for different types of knowledge and different types of challenge to that question. So it keeps it more uh, complex and, and, and well, well, yes, when I was first studying systems thinking, it was a case of, uh, these are technical terms, there are difficulties. Let's build a bridge across the river. It's difficult, but it can be done. And then there are messes. How do you build a bridge across the river when on one side you've got some NIMBY saying, oh, I don't want a bridge over here. And on the other side you said, well, we do want a bridge, but you've got these big newts and they're protected. Um, and then you've got other people coming in and making the things. And they always said, it's a swamp. And what systems thinking can do is find you a way out of the swamp. It may not be the way, it may not be the right way, but it will be a way. And that's why it's so interesting to do the iteration, because you say, well, I found this way out, and then actually, what are the consequences of there? And then you go back again, and you find maybe another way. Uh, and I'm, uh, my systems engineering really changed my life, because it kind of made me appreciate how we all interact. And I, I would love to teach that and critical thinking to every child from the age of four up. Uh, <laughs> because children are natural engineers, I think. And, and, and that's what we, you know, what you said as well about us being children and we need to be, um, I mean, that hit, hit so many things in my brain about colonialism and how we've, in the past, the North has treated the South with, um, you know, patronage and, and um, well, you're just children, you don't really know what you're doing. But equally, the other side of that is that curiosity and that, um, well, why does that work and why is the sky blue and why can't I go to bed at half past ten at night? And all of those things, I think we should be much more um, worthy of. And I, th I think that's what we're trying to do. Where's is instead of saying it's well, engineering is hard and it's dirty and you've got to have loads of maths and you've got to have loads of physics. It's recapture that curiosity, become problem solvers, let's have the creativity. Uh, so, um, Blessing Dana said, we need more engineers in Parliament to move the dial. Would any of our panellists consider the switch? Well, Chi and Wara, who is the only chartered engineer in Parliament, we are hoping she'll be able to join us later for the reception. Uh, but there is a big vote on the health and social care bill tonight, so it might be that she won't turn up. Um, some people know this about me, but a lot don't. I did spend a lot of my life trying to become the next Labour MP for various places. And unfortunately... Uh, a lot of obstacles were deliberately put in my way. So I decided in 2010, despite the fact that I nearly became Ed Miliband and then I nearly became Lisa Nandy, uh, that actually uh, what I would do is go and set up my own business and um, do some consulting. And then I was offered the job of the Chief Executive Officer of the Women's Engineering Society. And I said, actually, this is the job I want. So I have now got my great, my great job. But um, for others, um, Politics is rough and tumble. Any of you willing to enter the fray? Absolutely. Um, I, Yay! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up um, always, um, well, I was, I was meant to be a doctor first, and um, yes, it's every African child's um, obligation to demonstrate the intellect is, you know, first, first a doctor, then accountant, then engineer, then lawyer, then nobody. Um, <laughs> So I grew up wanting to be a doctor, but as soon as I think I was in high school, you know, I, I love politics, whether it's African, European politics, American mm. politics, it's, it's what I live for. I, I, I just generally it, interesting to see how decisions are made for people and really mapping out with that systems thinking hat in whose interest and for what outcome is each player actually in there. So it's, you know, always want to, coming back to service, um, you see that they didn't actually fit on the engineers and politicians. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's really that act of service, and but really being responsible and accountable for, for carrying that through into actually what then becomes, how does that, um, as Ellie said, um, that intervention become actually the desired outcome? Uh, well, well, indeed. Uh, I mean, my experience in politics, apart from the fact that I'm able to speak in public um, without notes, <laughs> it's a great skill to learn, uh, uh, has, has been that the 
we come to politics with aspiration to, to change the world and to be better, and you get caught up in the humdrum, how do I get a bill passed, how do I uh, influence that? And a lot of MPs um, end up with their constituents and uh, you know, are asked, well, can you make sure my cousin can get a job and my house is damp and the rest of it? And I think that that drags us down. But uh, another thing that came through systems engineering was the requisite law of variety by Ashby. And he said, for any system to work, and you can call this parliament, which serves the community, or a company that serves um, its clients, or a country that serves its citizens, you have to have as much variety in the system as the environment it seeks to serve. So therefore, we need more engineers in parliament, because there are plenty of engineers in the UK. We need more women in parliament. We need more gay people. We need more people with disabilities. We need more people from underrepresented ethnicities. So I think it's really great that you're willing to take that on. But I, I warn you, it's hard, it's tough. And if people don't like the, the, the cut of your jib, then they will put a lot of obstacles in <laughs> your way. <laughs> Ellie, uh, politics, is that something you're aspiring to? People always ask me this, you know. That's oh, right. like a question. Maybe you should think about it. Um, well, so I'm... I'd never say never. I, I think you're right that, that this work is really hard. Mm. But so is the engineering. It's the humdrum. It's the details. It's the... Okay, it, it, it's small projects that can be really radical. That You really know that you just need 10 grand for that, actually, and I can show you something. And so that... that we can talk on the, in these like, enjoyable high, high phrases and high theory and feel passionately about it, but the day-to-day -day work is kind of like um, grim and hard. And like maybe one Friday you go, oh my God, did you see that worked? Um, and, and so I, um, that is to say maybe, but also that I currently work with um, politicians I work, uh, and policymakers. I, the department I'm in at UCL is called Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. So we were set up to be able to serve and be useful to pu pu public policy decisions. And so I um, do a lot of work with the Greater London Authority making in the ways in which we can make London safer for women and girls. Um, and we carry on doing projects um, and trying to kind of do little bits and bobs. So, yeah, I think, um, let's see. <laughs> and pretty. Well, never say never. Um, interesting enough, 20 years ago um, in university, someone said you should become an academic, and I just thought it was a joke and laughed it off. <laughs> and here I am, 20 years later, an academic. Yeah. Um, so I think ambitions and aspirations shift. It's a shifting goalpost depending on our state of mind and where we are. I mean, at this point, I'm thinking that as academics, as engineers, we have to get our act together. We have to be better at communicating science and facts to the general public, working with media, working with policy makers. So I'm in a nice space where I've been on a media fellowship. I'm in a nice space where I am engaging in policy briefs, and I'm enjoying that space. So we'll see what the future holds. Okay, now we've got time for one more question, which I'm going to give to Tom Newby because he is from the Happold Foundation. Uh, so we've got about five minutes left, but I just want to say in the chat there are some fantastic uh, comments and support of each other and some great questions, and we'll try and put them to the panel and get them sent out later if we can. But Tom, final question, and please state your name and where you're from, although we already know. <laughs> and please stand up. Stand up. Tom, <laughs> Tom Newby from the Happold Foundation again. Um, Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. I had loads of questions, but one I wanted to ask, because uh, Mara and Ellie, you both talked to, about who we serve and how important that is, and that really chimed with me. But um, we didn't talk, you didn't talk about who do you think we serve now and who we should serve. I wondered whether you could maybe think about who do we actually serve as, an, as engineering professions, and, sh and should that be changing? Terrific question. Ellie? Um, we serve who we perceive to be the average person, I would say. Um, which is usually somebody who looks like us. Uh, we perceive ourselves as the average person, and I think as an as a, um, industry, of course, that means a white male middle class who has a reason, like not loaded, <laughs> but you know, has access to resources. Um, but we also serve in line with cultural ideologies and in line with what, where the, where the 
government strategy says we should be. be. Um, and I just think, uh, I think there's just so much more possibilities. There's so much more like color, diversity, uh, nuance, excitement, uh, need that just sits well, be well outside this kind of what I think of a sort of node as of average person. And uh, which is not an average person, there's no such thing. So I think we need to break down that model, kind of throw, I mean, it's useful for some things, you know, but there's so, there's so much more. And uh, let's get the models that help us do those things better. Maybe I could be more controversial. Uh, <laughs> well, we only have a couple <laughs> more minutes, and I want to give Mara the last word here. So. Uh, who, are, who should we serve and who do we serve? Who we serve, we always serve. I think we traditionally, we're humans. We serve people who look like us because at a certain extent, I can only, some, at, the most, at the most times, I can contextualize a problem based on what my experiences are, what I've been taught, how I, the lens with which I view the world, which comes back to, yes, we need to become a bit, bit more diverse in our, who we collectively, how we collectively, you know, you know, target intervention. Who should we serve? I think we should come back to the question is where is the most impactful and most needed intervention? And if we start to direct those questions from that lens, like what outcome in society are we going for? We may, we may find ourselves building or doing, not, not the word is not building, coming up with very different interventions for very different outcomes. Fantastic. It's been my pleasure to be your chair for this evening, and I'd like to thank Dr. Priti Parikh, Dr. Ellie Cosgrave, and Mara Tafadzwa Marconi. I'm Elizabeth Donnelly, and thank you very much to the Hapold Foundation. Good evening.